Grazie a Molly Nesbitt, ci ha probabilmente aiutato molto a capire come la generazione di un'idea nasca nel, 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 in un'ipotesi di un artista, in una visione di un artista e si trasformi, si strutturi e prenda finalmente forma definitiva nella percezione del pubblico che con quell'idea sotto un'altra un forma si, si confronta. Mi ha molto mh, colpito il fatto che abbia deciso di passare attraverso il, la, la tela del ragno e, e di concludere con l'immagine che è stata un'immagine essenziale della riflessione che Bruno Latour ha uh, condotto sull'opera di, di Thomas Saraceno. Um, qui è importante che io faccia, come dire, Faccio un, un esempio e eh, dia un piccolo fatto di cronaca. Il testo di Bruno Latour sull'opera eh, di Thomas Saraceno, scritto dopo la visione eh, della Biennale di Venezia del 2009, è un dogma di Thomas. Um, non ci sono altri testi come quello per ora. <ride> Vediamo che cosa ci propone ora, ora Bruno Latour che siano imprescindibili per poterlo avvicinare. Quindi eh, sappiate che, e questo è un come dire, è forse uno statement un po', un po' importante. Sapete che se volete confrontarvi con Thomas Saraceno, se avete letto il testo di Bruno Latour, le cose sono diverse, più morbide, più fluide, hanno un altro stato, un altro modo di, modo di relazione. Quindi non, non aggiungo altro, eh, sono sicuramente curioso di capire, tutti siamo curiosi di capire come la visione del, eh, dell'opera di, di Thomas abbia cambiato le idee che, che, che Bruno Latour si è fatto sul, sul suo lavoro e sui suoi lavori precedenti. Um, gli cedo senz'altro la parola uh, se, introducendolo come un pensatore, un filosofo che si è occupato di questioni che hanno a che fare sia di uh, filosofia della scienza e della tecnologia, sia che hanno a che fare con la sociologia, sia che hanno a che fare con l'ambiente, sia con le politiche dell'ambiente e che ha scritto due libri fondamentali degli ultimi, degli ultimi vent'anni che, vent che vi consiglio assolutamente. Eh, lascio la parola a Bruno Latour. Thank you very much. I'll speak um, slowly because the acoustic here is not very um, easy. It's not a seminar. Thank you very much for having allowed me to feel like a, a fly on a fly tape. I don't know if it's name. In the summer, I'm always wondering how does it feel to be a fly stuck onto one of his uh, fly tape. And I, that's a bit the way I felt when I was up there uh, in one of his uh, envelopes. At some time, you're stuck into it. But I'm not going to comment um, this work here as a work of art because I don't think it's part of art, at least not part of modern art, because it's a completely non-modern piece, exploration of something which I would characterize, I don't know if Thomas accepts uh, the label, something which has to do with the habitat, the question of habitat, more generally called ecology, but not in the sense of having to do with nature, as a sort of uh, many of the things which were done in the 19th century, but something which is trying to understand the shapeless. I mean, you mentioned, Andreas, the word shapeless, which is exactly one of the elements of the non-environment environment in which we are now embedded, but without knowing what it is. So for me, the work of uh, Thomas, the spider work, as well as this one, uh, and many of the other globulo work, um, but I like that one better because it's less mimetic, um, deal with an exploration of this uh, habitat question. What it is to be in a shapeless environment, if I use a big word, maybe too big, uh, at the time of the Anthropocene, basically. So this is, at the time of the Anthropocene, the question of is it art, is it not art, doesn't seem so uh, important because the question is this sort of Mabius strip, 
which is the inside-outside. I was very interested to learn that there is actually a mountaineer in the exhibition which is trying to retrieve and save the people who have been sucked into the envelopes. And it's a real mountaineer, apparently, from the Alps, uh, which is a typical symptom of this Mebius trip, where when you are in the outside, you don't know if you are in or out, the same with Armin Linker's work, actually. And when you are uh, inside, you might be suddenly meeting a mountainer. So this Mebius strip, which is another way of defining the Anthropocene, is a very complex uh, experiment which is explored by what I'd like to call the, the two aesthetics. The aesthetics of the science first, aesthetics in the in my view, in the original sense, that is what makes artificially felt the event of things which are not directly accessible to the senses, which is done in science through instrumentation, I mean, satellite, all sort of uh, expeditions, uh, sensors, and sensors is an aesthetic term, even though it's in the sciences, and then there is the aesthetics which is the one we associate with art, but it's not actually part of art, it's part of a much larger uh, cultivation of sensitivity to things which are not directly accessible. And it struck me in the work uh, of Thomas, uh, even in the earlier work, and of course in the spider work, uh, how much of his collaboration between the two aesthetics is, is important, and again, not in a mimetic way. Science is not mimetic and uh, this exploration by Thomas is not uh, mimetic either. It's artificial. It's an artificial transformation of how do we render ourselves sensitive to threat. And I think that's why maybe we'll have a discussion later, but I, I don't think it can be associated with modern art. Modern art was interested in a lot of critical work, but it was not interested in meeting a threat. And all this work seems to be meeting the threat, the threat of arriving under, inside, outside the Anthropocene. So it, it, it's, a, it's a set of art, and it's actually very uh, clear in design studies as well, where you meet a threat which is coming to you and you don't know how to do it, which is a very different task than the one which was done in the 20th century by destroying as much as possible of the past. And actually, I think it's quite beautiful here that you can, in the same minute, compare Kiefer's work, which is a typical 20th century um, work of art, and, and Thomas, which has, even the work art doesn't fit but it's certainly not in any way uh, deconstruction. It doesn't have to be and to deal with ruins. It doesn't have to be with critique. And I, I like actually uh, Thomas' work because it's a naive work and not a critical work. I mean, critique is a sort of completely tiring, emptied, uh, finished sort of end. And it, I mean, Kiefer's is still beautiful, of course, like, I mean, the sort of nostalgic ruins, but it's, and it's clearly art, but it's 20th century. 20th century had its charms, but now it's completely different. We are meeting a threat, and it's not a question of critique, it's a question of what shape is this uh, situation when we uh, find ourselves. And the ourself itself is, is, is completely uh, uncertain. So the way I interpret this work, but I don't leave the afternoon to, to, <laughs> to make sense of it, and you need to think a lot about uh, Thomas' uh, work, is I think this uh, exploration of a dependency, not, I mean, so most of you must have had the experience or will have the experience. Not so much, I was not struck by the fact that when you move, other moves. 
because you can do that in a subway station as well. I mean, when you move, other moves. I mean, this is not very original. What is very original is that you move and you feel that the medium, which is the air here, or the heat, which is very difficult to capture, is actually render uh, foregrounded. So it's actually the plastic, which is the great social, sociological invention of this piece. It's that you feel through the very strange, and I understand high-tech, very high-tech, and I understand very expensive plastic, uh, not your common plastic for garbage or something like that, uh, that you, you begin to get um, a very complex feeling of medium which is not nice, even though many people enjoy it. It's frightening as well, and it has all sort of in ecological metaphors of water, air, but you can suffocate a bit in it. Uh, it has various degrees of resistance. Sometimes it looks like a, uh, a storm, like waves in a storm. So it has some of a character. Um, I have to give the name of the being which is here um, appealed to, which is Gaia. If Gaia is a shapeless envelope, Gaia is the name which many scientists uh, interested in Earth science give to the, the Earth, but they don't know what the shape of the Earth is either. It's not a globe, which is very important. It's not a globe, it's envelopes. Envelopes of which the variation is actually uncertain. The inertia of this envelope is uh, disputable. And I think that's the way I, I sort of, uh, I don't think it is, it is any, any nice feeling of back to the womb. It's on the contrary being sent, maybe this is, we'd have to discuss that, something which is more frightening than that. It's, it's the outside, not the inside. So in uh, Sloterdijk's uh, definition, it would be the third volume of sphere, not the first one. It's not the warm part, it's actually the third one, something which has to do with forms precisely, with a sort of uncertainty about what it is inside and outside. And what is very um, striking, I think is the best um, and most important invention is to have these three envelopes. Because if you had only one, it would be a pretty boring piece. It would be a uh, trampoline, you say trampoline in, in English? Tramp I mean, you, which is nice, I mean, my grandchild loves that, but it, it would be just that. And it's extremely uh, frightening to be so close and completely separated from people you cannot even talk to. I made a, a film which I hope will make a big success of Molly crawling through the middle envelope. But at some point she disappeared because someone else at the other level was uh, overcoming her, so to speak. So there's a, uh, a frightening cast element into it. So I was amused to see in the reviews that people uh, were insisting on the, uh, the way <laughs> uh, it showed the solidarity uh, of the people, yes, inside one of the envelopes maybe, but not between the envelopes. I mean, you can actually say hello, but there is no direct connection, and I think that's very interesting. Another of this non-mimetic exploration of what it will be to be in a shapeless envi environment which is simultaneously threatening so that it's exploring a situation which is what it is to live on or in or with or against Gaia. And that's a very uh, strange impression which is very difficult to get because we are so obsessed by the sociology, the usual sociology that we are dealing with humans, I mean, relation between humans, that it's very difficult to foreground the uh, medium which would simultaneously react and exclude. I mean, you can, of course, talk about it. You can talk about the importance of the atmosphere, the importance of uh, 
carbon dioxide, you can talk about it, but it's not the same thing as feeling that you cannot move without all of this transformation, which takes very different shapes, which are uncertain and have a lot of inertia. So I think that's, that's what is so uh, interesting in, in, in my view, and the, the, the impression of always to be, maybe I'm too pessimistic and I'm, not, I'm, I'm also old, and there were lots of young kids in it, who seem to enjoy themselves and to do the trampolino element. But I think the, the, the suffocation aspect can be one part of it, that is you can actually be uncertain about the air you breathe, and when you move, you move in strange ways, which is exactly the situation which I think can be characterized as the Anthropocene situation. Maybe this is too big, but we are here to try to think about a very important piece of work, which is that in the most of, uh, I mean, to take uh, an argument that uh, Chakrabarti had made that uh, before human history was actually unfolding into a decor which was itself supposed to be stable, and now everything which was in the decor is becoming unstable and is joining in the history of humans, which is what I use the word geostory, which is, it, it, it's not history, it's geostory, which is what you move, but the decor moves as well. So I think the great, and I'll finish on that, the great originality of this work is to have explored, not to put us in an environment, but to have brought part of the environment in an action, uncertain action, of which the participants are only one part. So if we wanted to illustrate, so maybe it's connected to the action of the people, but I think in a very different register from the one uh, which would have been done around piece of art, which is here, I'm not an art historian, so I probably say things which are uh, too uh, simple-minded. The decor, there is no decor. There is no, decor is an English word. I mean, there is no frame inside which human history unfold. We sort of knew it, but it's much more difficult to make it sensitive, to, to make it feel that every element of where you sit is actually moving with you in a way which is uh, open to uncertainty. So it's not a nice piece. No, it's not a peaceful piece, even though you can do trampolino on it. This is what I enjoy. It. It's extremely funny. And in a way, it's terrible. It's very, even much more tragic than Kiefer's piece. Because Kiefer is tragic in a way we are completely used to. Humans build things and it comes to ruin. I mean, Italy is full of us, so it's perfect. But here it's not about ruins. Ruins is sort of dystopic, but after all, we know all about ruins since the Greek and the Romans. Here it's not about ruins. It's about the impossibility of distinguishing between the history and the history of the decor. And it's not ne ne nonetheless, for that reason, nicer. So there's an interesting fight, I find, between Kiefer's piece and your piece. You could say, well, one of them is enjoyable and high-tech, and it's the future. You can hype it, probably. And the other is ruin, it's a somber, it's tragic. I think it's exactly the opposite, is that the somber, tragic view of Kiefer, we feel at home with it, because that's the whole 20th century history. With this one, this is our future, and it's not necessarily one which uh, we look forward to it. <laughs>